Welcome to the 2017 Bald Move Awards, the Baldies, the fourth annual Baldies. That's uh, a lot of years. That's a lot of years. It's, 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 this joke has gone on long farther than I anticipated. It's turned into an annual event. Jim and I are wearing our, our fanciest uh, tuxedo t-shirts to mark the occasion. Uh, I know I always promise to do bigger and better things this uh, each, each year. Uh, I think next year, the fifth annual. Like I don't, I don't sure if we'll have enough swing to get like an actual physical location and 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 have people come and dress up. But by God, I got to get a golden bust of Patrick Stewart commissioned, mm -hmm. and I got to get the previous winners engraved upon that base. And if not, I feel like, I'll feel like a fucking failure. That's the bare minimum. This year, the way we plussed it is we added write-in categories for the user choice on the the six main categories. Uh, we got fancier envelopes to rip open. Uh, Jim actually does not know the community winners. So there'll be a, a little bit of a surprise there. And uh, yeah, so this is this is the Baldi's Award. This is the, an awards show that is just as terrible and arbitrary and capricious as all other award shows with the small caveat of it only contains stuff that Jim and I have seen. That is mm -hmm. the Bald Move Awards in a nutshell. It doesn't have stuff like... If, if there's the best, if this is not the best comedy, this is the best comedy we've both seen. This is not the best drama, it's the best drama that we've both seen. Now, some of the bigger categories, I think they're one and the same. Like, our dramas are going sure, to be... we cover a lot of really good shows. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm going to not be embarrassed by our choice of, like, dramas or movies. Uh, comedies, eh, I don't know. I mean, and we also got some fun categories that, that the J Jim and I just come up with and nobody votes on. Uh, but again, they're just as arbitrary and capricious as any other award show. Uh, is there anything else we want to say? Oh, yes. You might have questions like, why did Jim and Aaron rank this thing over that thing? Or why did Jim and Aaron think this actor did a better job than this other actor? And I will say we have potentially over a dozen hours of deliberations on all these categories where we actually recorded us coming up with these lists and arguing and wrestling and making cases. And they're all... Uh, they're all po individual podcasts. They are um, kind of grouped together by categories. So if you want to know like what we had to say about the best drama, there'll be one of those, or maybe the actors are all packaged together. Um, and they those will be in your firehose feed. So if you don't know what a firehose feed is, go to baldmove.com, click on podcast, and there'll be an option to get all the podcasts. Uh, you can check that out there. Probably in the Bald Move TV. I think so, yeah. Probably in the Bald um, Move TV category, too. So if you want to subscribe to that feed, you can get them. Or listen uh, on the, the, the website. Or watch it on the website. Because this is uh, this is free video. The rare premium, non-premium video. And you can see us in our fanciest tuxedo shirts. Uh, and there are categories in there that we aren't actually presenting today. So yeah. um, there, that we talk a little bit about the meta of television uh, over the course of last year. Um in regards to a few different things and we also talk about like notable exceptions that were not right. on this list for various reasons and why right um so there's a lot of stuff in those deliberations that you will not get uh unless you go listen to them. this is the award show this is not that all that stuff is the tech the technology and and what do they call that the like that that's where the nerds show up the the day before the oscars oh yeah if you get the best special effect for an alien's forehead glistening uh-huh uh those are the those, that, that stuff's in the nerd categories that you're not going to get uh, at the gala event uh so let's get right into it these these envelopes are burning holes in our pockets do you want to open up the first one? Uh, sure, I'll do that. Please, please read the category and uh, the 2017 Bald Move Award for Best Bald Movie. So, bald movies again. This is these are not the movies that came out in 2017. These are the movies that came out that we watched as a first run bald movie. Right. Uh, wait, wait, wait. The nominees in alphabetical order. Uh, almost, okay. see, almost. Oh, we're just by, by the seat. I just, pants I'm on just this. itching to get this. I know they're open burning there. holes in our pockets. I've we're established this in our tuxedo pockets. They're, they're not going to get the deposit back on these tuxedo t-shirts. Uh, Baby Driver, Blade Runner, 2049, The Disaster Artist, Dunkirk, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Two, It, John Wick. Chapter Two, Logan, Spider Man, Homecoming, and Wonder Woman. That is uh, the top ten bald movies in no particular order. Actually, Except in alphabetical, a alphabetically particular order. <laughs> the winner is. Well, that that was a that's a poor rip. This is this is me Bad rip. floundering on stage. Come on, Warren Beatty, get it together. Going, oh God, it's Moonlight. My fingers, and the winner is 
Number one, Dunkirk. All right, 2017, yes. Christopher Nolan. Dunkirk. Okay, let's go to let's go to the video screen to see the breakdowns here. Uh, nice. So number one is Dunkirk. Number two, Blade Runner. Number three, Baby Driver. Number four, It. Number five, Logan. Uh, let's talk about our rationale here. Uh, mm -hmm. You can see an italicized the top the top ten rounded out. Number six, Disaster Artist. Number seven, Spider Man. Number eight, Guardians two. Six or nine, John Wick to uh, ten, Wonder Woman. Um, how's our how's our top five shake out here, Jim? Uh, you, where do you want to start? I mean, the I can talk about the rationale for number one, certainly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Dunkirk was uh, telling a very interesting and compelling story um, in, in the film, and also the way it structured the film was mm -hmm. so impressive um, with the three different. I guess scales of time all coming together at the very end um, made it, in my opinion, one of the most exciting. It was extremely well acted. Uh, like I said, the the story was great. I mean, the story is real life too. So, right. uh, yeah, I, I think everything about Dunkirk just added up to an excellent package. For me. Yeah, no, it's great, and it's something that I didn't, you know. Uh, U.S. history, surprise, surprise, uh, kind of begins with, uh, if you're taught in high school, it kind of begins with the you know, D-Day invasion uh -huh. uh, and World War II. So, like, seeing the prelude to essentially the Battle of Britain um, and the, the desperate evacuation of this, this British expeditionary force in the face of being hammered between the advancing Nazis and uh, the, the Atlantic Ocean um, was pretty, pretty powerful. The English Channel, I should, I should say. Yeah. Um, I think for the others, uh, check the deliberations. Yeah. I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. If you want yeah. the rationale on numbers two through 10. Now, let's talk about community. Uh, this is uh, not... what are we running? A, a popularity contest here, the, people? We are. The community, the really, oh, the community Jesus. choice literally is a, 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 so this was a, this is a poll that we opened for one week, uh, to let people, um, nominate their choices. Number one choice, not surprisingly, Star Wars episode eight, The Last Jedi at 21% of the community vote. Mm. Um, I mean, I disagree. I don't think Star Wars even made her top ten. Um, I was you. You liked the movie more than me, uh, but I also think your art. Your, your it's a, it's a bit cooled off after mm -hmm. you've thought about it. Yeah. I, uh, you know, famously, I saw it twice and recorded a podcast on it. Um, but it, it, it's I. I'm not going to begrudge anyone for liking that movie. And, I and wish I, wonder, I was in your among your ranks. I do wonder how much of the community vote is based on purely the movie, and how much it is based on the podcast, because I know people really enjoyed the podcasts that's that we true did and we did that's two true. of them so that's true. um that could definitely be an influencer here but, but no i wish i was with you i wish I, I i need to find a dead rebel uniform on the beach s s strip into it and then try to hide out amongst you while we evacuate to the salt planet uh logan at 15 percent. you know comic book movies do well mm -hmm. uh and logan was a damn fine comic book movie it hit our top five it's 15 percent in the community vote dunkirk got 10 percent, probably on the strength of it just being great it's probably yeah. the probably the best if you want to talk you know subjective objective movie standards of the bald movies baby driver is a hell of a lot of fun was number three in our list at eight percent and blade runner 2049 seven percent honestly uh the community and us are at one except for star wars and it and yes. it, yeah, yeah, they did the, the it, the, the the scary scary it movie uh, did didn't make it. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so let us continue with a non envelope category. Uh, this is going to be the biggest miss. Biggest. The miss. biggest miss is an annual category where Jim and I look back and say, "Oh God damn it, we should have done a podcast on this if we'd known it was going to be as good, or popular, or interesting, uh, or various other reasons we would have done that." So uh, we're going to do this in reverse. We're just going to talk about the number five and work our way up. Uh, number five, you want to take this one, Jim? No, I don't have any. You don't have me. notes in front of you? Okay. No. <laughs> uh, let me switch over here, and here we go. There we go. Number five? Yeah. Hidden Figures. Oh, yeah. I saw this last year after it came out. For one reason or another, I don't think we could make it to uh, our bald movie that night. Yeah, there was, was some kind of I, I don't I don't know if it was is that or if it's just like a, a, a conflict where we thought well this was maybe the better movie but there was a bigger more popular movie. However, yeah. we did it. We fucked up because that was a great great movie. Right, and I didn't end up seeing it for like a couple weeks at, and, until a couple weeks after that. And by then, it was you know uh, here and gone. So um, we never did a podcast on this one, and I always felt like 
it was such a good movie and I felt like it was kind of an important movie in a lot of ways and we just didn't get to covering it. Right. And it's a great, it's also a great, you know, uh, I guess retort to a lot of people saying that like, oh, racism has been over for so long. Right. Like, did we go to the moon a long time ago? If you say we didn't, if it's, it's fairly recent in human history, then there is just some blatant crazy ass racism that these women had to overcome to, by the way, calculate figures to put men in the orbit and on the moon. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Um, and it's a hidden figures. It's, it's a, it's a double meaning because it's also the hidden role that these women, uh, have played in the, in the, the history of the space race. So yeah, he's pretty good. Uh, biggest mists number four, star Trek discovery. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like we're at fault here. If Star Trek had came out when it was supposed to come out, uh -huh. we've been all over that. Star Trek came out towards the end of the year when we were completely swamped and up to our ass and various alligators and crocodiles. Uh, also, if, if Voyager and Enterprise had been any good, we'd be true. all over it. True. There, there was a lot of expectation here of, yeah. of it not being very good. Right. This is the long-awaited heir to a previous unbroken chain of pristine quality. <laughs> right there would have been a little bit more hype. But Star Trek Discovery, in retrospect, was really good and would have been really interesting and a pretty popular podcast, and uh, we done we done fucked up. Uh, number three, The Expanse. Mm. We did do a series of three or four Bald Move TVs on this with our, yep. our buddy Levi, but I think The Expanse is the heir to the somewhat broken uh uh star trek legacy of quality science fiction it's it's it, it's unbelievably good and has no business being that good on the sci-fi network yeah this 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 shares airtime with sharknado 7 and z nation mm -hmm. and then the best hard science fiction since maybe babylon 5 um mm -hmm. since since Fab since since battlestar Battles, okay. but even yeah. battles, even I, Battlestar I is not this hard, hard sci-fi. Sure, I, I would agree with that though. Um, if you're a science fiction fan at all, you've got you you owe it to yourself to check out the Expanse. I believe you can watch the first two seasons free on both Amazon and Hulu. Check it out and see if we're wrong. This is it's 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 essentially set 150 years into the future where the solar system like Mars and outer belt has been colonized and it's a it's it's the game of thrones for our solar system. Mm -hmm. The political intrigue between the different planets and asteroid belters is is just really cool. Uh Twin Peaks. Um this is a tough one because you had no desire to get any in in any of this. We no. watched Twin Peaks the first one, the first couple episodes because it was a commission podcast and I immediately was intrigued with the premise and the uh, the, the the craziness of the television and how it was that crazy back in the 90s um and i started watching a new series and i fully intended to have like a rotating list of uh well-regarded bald move commentators to do this with me and again it it i just ran out of time i ran out of time and i feel like that would have been a really big hit for us and i, I done fucked up uh number one the deuce mm -hmm. The Deuce, we should have known. It was David Simon. It was uh, it was a chance to get in on the ground floor of perhaps the next wire. And why didn't we do that? Was another just like it's too it's just too late in the year and we yeah there there was so much else on. It came out when I think it came out when Mr. Robot Walking Dead and finishing up season two of Game of Thrones. Where's Game of Thrones, we're all, yeah, we're all happening at the same yeah. time. So we were like kind of like full capacity, uh, but that would have been a great one. We did record two or perhaps three The Deuce uh, Bald Move TV segments, mm -hmm. which I thought were turned out pretty good. Uh, and we'll see how the schedule. These are all things that we, if the schedule had been a little bit different, we would have covered and perhaps should have covered. Okay, next big category. I'll open this one if you do not mind. Uh this is the 2017 Bald Move Award for Best Commission Podcast. The nominees in no particular, well, in, in alphabetical, alphabetically particular order. Uh, American Gangster, The Dark Knight, Jackie Brown, Master and Commander, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, Star Wars, Return of the Jedi, Terminator 2, Judgment Day, There Will Be Blood, The Wicker Man, and Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Oh my goodness, who is going to win the 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 the, 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 the pulse pounding mystery of this of the whole thing? 
We've got, uh, for the winner, There Will Be Blood. Oh. It's the best commission podcast in 2017, according to Jim and I. Uh, let's go to the big screen to, to look at our options here. So... Uh, our top five was. I feel like we need to play clips. That that's how we. That's plus next this year thing. pluses. Next we year. need clips from these movies. Yeah. From the, yes, you're absolutely right. That maybe would be with awesome. our faces on the actors instead of the real actors. <laughs> Can we do the thing where we cut out our lips and we just do yeah. do, do, <laughs> do lines? From... Yeah, I can't wait till we do hidden figures and <laughs> oh no digital digital blackface. Yeah, let's do that. Um, maybe not the greatest. Maybe idea. clips. Maybe yeah, clips is clips. the best way to show respect for these things that we love. Uh, there will be blood. Um, mm-hmm. There will be blood was shockingly good. It's one of those things where it's it's like a hundred year old bottle of wine that I had set around for a special occasion, and someone commissioned it, and I brought it off the shelf, and I'm like, well, I know this is going to be fucking awesome, and it was that much better than I even thought it was going to be. Yeah, it's 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 it instantly I recognized it as uh like a Godfather level. I watched it twice during for the commission. I've watched it again since then. Uh, and I'll be watching it probably dozens of more times before I shuffle off this mortal coil. Uh, Paul Thomas Anderson, one of the most talented visionary directors we have, combined forces with Daniel Day-Lewis, probably the greatest uh, living actor that we have. Uh, it was it was it was awesome. I thought the podcast was pretty good too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, this category we should say is very much a blend of media enjoyment we actually have a scale called the sfim index where it's the surprise factor the fun factor the interest and the media quality you can see us get go into that on the deliberations and uh you know the, the cool thing about um there will be blood is it managed to score pretty high in a surprise factor because again i was surprised at just how jaw-droppingly good this movie is everyone should stop and watch it if you haven't yet uh number two american gangster Again, this is one that we should have known was good, but like it's one of those Ridley Scott films that kind of came out, and you know it has uh, it has um, uh, shit. I've fucking Denzel Washington. Denzel Washington in it, and Russell Crowe Russell Crow in it, and it's about you know a true crime. It's about um, this one particular man named Frank who takes over the drug trade in New York uh, very creatively. Uh, using some some connections he built in the during the Vietnam War, and it's just it's just a great period piece. It's a great crime film, uh, and it's uh, again pretty good podcast. Number three, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. This was just an hour or so of me and Jim brutalizing Grandpa Joe. Yeah, g- giving him what he deserved. It in was my mind. It was it was a loose fun c- podcast. It was a riot in the streets. It was it was open season on Grandpa Joe Day, and we had a lot of fun doing it. Uh, for Master and Commander, I recused myself for most of these deliberations because the, I'm so far in the tank for this movie. But what really pleased me was how much my friend enjoyed the movie, and that was a delight uh, for me. And it's a it's a great it's a great film. Mm-hmm. If you're interested, I mean, it's I would say if you're interested in sailing, if you're interested in period stuff, if it's just a really good film about a very peculiar way to live your life a few hundred years ago that seems insane. Yeah. It's it, they they were the astronauts of their day, except for they shot at each other right if they succeeded in what they were doing the other team dies and sinks like it's 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 insane uh and five jackie brown uh the rare tarantino film that i had not seen yet uh and it was it was a goodie yeah it was everything i hoped uh let's talk about are, the... are, are we going through each of these in the categories what do you mean um like when we when we announce the winner we're not we're talking about all the the nominees in the top five i think so that's what okay. we, that, that's what we're doing um the for community we just didn't do that in the first category which confused me oh sorry okay. well we don't have to because we do we do I, I mean we have all the deliberations this is something is you don't see in the oscars where the yeah. presenters are just like are, are we are we in doing this right actually you did last year you did see that it was pretty high profile oh yeah uh, the community, uh, no surprise, The Dark Knight, fourteen percent. That was huh. a, that's a great popular movie that we did a really good. Po- I think we did a good podcast in. I am kind of surprised at that. Really, I, I thought Willy Wonka would be higher on this list. Honestly, uh, The Dark Knight got fourteen percent of the vote. Star Wars: Return of the Jedi, Star Wars: Pride, continuing to run strong among among the bald movement, uh, got eleven percent. That was a fun podcast. Uh, that was number nine on our list. Mm-hmm. Uh, we did it live down in Huntsville in front of uh, some fans, and uh, Star Wars is always a good time to talk about. Um, there will be blood, 9%. The quality cannot be denied. Reservoir Dogs, just under that, uh, also 9%. Not the Tarantino movie I expected to see. Yeah, true. But I don't know. Like I can, 
Reservoir Dogs is interesting because it's like such a, um, it's it's got so much of the DNA of what's to come. Yeah. Um, and then Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory because everybody loves taking cheap shots at they're fucking not, Grandpa they're not Joe. They're warranted. Shots. They yeah. are warranted shots at Grandpa Joe. Absolutely. Uh, all right. So great job for all to for, to there will be blood and the dark night. Uh, and we will we will we will be moving on. Yeah. Uh, here's an interesting one. Best podcast for a show we didn't watch. Oh, okay. Uh, Jim, would you like to tell the people a little bit about what uh, there is? There's a single single yeah, entry, the and they are the, the nominees are, are in no particular order. Uh, number one, Riverdale. Uh, the winner is Riverdale. Riverdale, yeah. There are probably give it up for Riverdale, everybody. There are probably a lot of people here listening to this podcast that have no fucking clue what we're talking about. Jim, right. can you describe to us the Riverdale project? Ra ra Riverdale. <laughs> so th- there were there were actually two podcasts that we used to cover Riverdale. Um, the first being Ra ra Riverdale, mm-hmm. uh, which was an attempt by us to cover a show that we literally did not watch. Um, mostly true. We watched the pilot just mm-hmm. to get in the right frame of mind. And then from there on out, we covered the entire season. Mm-hmm. And uh, except for maybe the last episode yeah. intentionally. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, a- and we would watch the previously ons, watch the next time ons, uh, and then do a podcast based entirely on that footage. Yeah. Uh, and the resulting podcast is just a train wreck shit show. Uh-huh. Um, somewhere along along the way, we decide to make all the worst podcaster mistakes uh-huh. um, of like new podcasters intentionally. Yep. And it just it went off the rails in I think a truly <laughs> glorious way. I loved it because like so uh, some of the things we wanted to do because we didn't have any particular goals for the experiment, um, but we thought it'd be funny if people would because because we did this experiment with the club we essentially mm-hmm. did it in our vip forums we told people what we we're going to do and then we used that to get a lot of positive reviews on our terrible podcast like we had hundreds yeah. of positive reviews and but we also got a few like really angry ones because we obviously don't know what we're talking about we got some feedback along those lines it was it was just really fun we did pseudonyms as al and joe podcast on Janus, uh who are just like you know just out there and 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 trying to trying to do this thing um it was fun it yeah. was fun uh we record we we had video recordings of us actually recording it because it was a side splitting sometimes experience to just riff on what th- things might be happening yeah uh we, and we recorded a second podcast called har har riverdale which yes. was only available to club members um and only if you had like the direct link to the feed that yeah we, yeah, we, yeah it was all out of forums yeah and and so on that podcast we got we got on the mics and we talked about the experience of recording yeah. Ra Ra Riverdale yeah, you know yeah, yeah. why what were we thinking when we made these jokes and uh-huh. you know why were we doing the certain things and it was all like riffing and brainstorming and coming up with the ideas for next week's show you know yeah. so like play. 15 minutes of of reviews uh-huh. or or to maybe like skip entirely the final episode like a lot of things we should go back developed and look, in that podcast because there's been a season since i wonder like what the itunes because and we were like we left as the <laughs> highest rated most rated podcast yeah. so i imagine a lot of people in season two tried us out uh-huh. like i bet there's a lot of uh return to mean reviews on this thing oh i'm um, sure especially since we stopped doing it. But yeah, if it, that seems remotely funny. We just did it as a funny social experiment. It's all, uh, I mean, the, the, you, you can get the, if you search for Ra Ra Riverdale, like I, I don't even know if it's on Bald Move. We, we hosted it off of Bald Move. It's not available uh-huh. on Bald Move. If you search for Ra Ra Riverdale, you should be able to find it, no problem. It's on iTunes. Mm-hmm. And then uh, you have to dig for it in the club for, for Har Har. Yep. Um, Okay, we are back to the red envelopes. Jim, I believe it's your turn. Oh, boy. Uh, we are going to open up the best comedy. Is that what we're going for That's here? That's correct. All right. Best comedy. You want to read the nominees? Uh, the nominees in particular alphabetical order uh, is Always Sunny in Philadelphia. It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. American Vandal, the Netflix original. BoJack Horseman Season 4, also Netflix original. Glow, also Netflix original. Lady Dynamite, also Netflix original. And last week tonight, definitely not a Netflix. HBO, original. John Oliver show on HBO. Uh, Love, also a Netflix original. Mystery Science Theater three thousand, The Return, also a Netflix original. Rick and Morty, 
on Comedy Central, Adult Swim, and Tour de Pharmacy, also on HBO. Those are your nominees. Who is the winner for the 2017 Best Comedy? The winner is the envelope. It's defeating me every time. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're too fancy. They're, they're too, too fancy. fancy. The, the, the thread count, the fiber counts are too high. And too the, damn high. The winner of the 2017 Bald Move Award for Best TV Comedy goes to... Lady Dynamite. Lady Dynamite. The best show about a potentially a person struggling. The best comedy show about a person struggling with mental illness uh, ever made, perhaps. I don't know. I haven't seen. I'm not an expert at it. Let's uh, let's go to the big screen to, to discuss the detailed results. Uh, okay. So we had. So we had. Uh, we had. Uh, this is the the one that I was really curious about as far as um, could the community was involved because we don't watch a lot of comedies. Primarily because right. comedies are very hard to do podcasts on. Right. These are kind of things that we watch in our own, own time. I thought Lady Dynamite was an amazing show when it first came out about Maria Bamford and her kind of breakdown getting famous in Hollywood. And then season two was the concept of what was season one like making. Uh, so, so season two is a tongue-in-cheek telling of the making of season one. And the show within the show is called Maria Bamford's Fucking Nuts. It's just it's just really funny, and it's 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 really got our hooks in Cecily and I. Like we quote it all the time. Um, it's pretty great. Uh, similarly, BoJack Horseman, another show about that the, the deals with a lot of topics of mental illness and alternative I don't know ways to look at things. And it's about a guy with a horse for a head who was in a very famous TV show in the '80s or '90s, and now he's kind of washed up has been. Uh, and then you got Rick and Morty, which everybody knows about, mm -hmm. uh, American Vandal, which is a, is a s very good satire of serial, the podcast, making a murderer and jinx, mm -hmm. like the rush of true crime documentaries and podcasts. Uh, and it's set in a high school about a man, about a, 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 a young man expelled for spray painting 22 dicks on the teacher's cars in a teacher's parking lot. And then Always Sunny, uh, who had kind of sagged and been flagging the last few years, I caught back with a returning, uh, a stunning return to form this season or last year's season. Uh, let's talk about the community. Um, yeah, the community results are not too surprising. Rick and Morty won a twenty-four percent of the vote. Yeah, here is where the other category shined. Um, Sixteen mm percent -hmm. of the vote for comedy went other than the suggestions that that Jim and I made. The Good Place got 32% of that vote. Veep got another 10% of the other category. Master of None, 6%. I've, Veep is a show that I wa background watch because my, my wife watches it, and it's not my cup of tea, but I understand why it's good and why people like it. The Good Place, I've heard so many good things from so many different people whose opinions yeah. I respect. I feel like I got to check it out now. Yeah. Uh, and the Master of None also um, has a reputation of being very good. Last week tonight, 11%. Silicon Valley, 8%. BoJack Horseman, 7%. Uh, I did not think Silicon Valley had a very strong year. I didn't year. either. But it is popular. Sure. It is popular, and it is popular probably in one of the core bald move demographics. Uh, young, nerd, young nerdy men. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the demographic we fall into. Unfortunately, it didn't fall into our top, our top 10. Uh, shall we... Move mosey on down to another category. Yeah, that I mean, let's good. let's like you know, let's uh, we don't have any commercial breaks. We don't have any uh, getting up and getting cocktails. Let's just just, get, just keep getting right to it. Uh, let's see, I got to stage up the next one. Best debut slash pilot. So this is a category where we essentially say what is the best rookie show, and of those rookie shows, which had like you know the, a particularly fine pilot. You know, we think of yeah. like. The Breaking Bads, mm -hmm. um, a pilot that just grabs you and demands that you keep watching. The opposite of like a slow burn. Mad Men would be a great example of a slow burn. Mm -hmm. um, so the nominees, well, no, the nominees, we, we don't do this in this category. Uh, let's go the, the bottom up. Uh, number five, American Vandal. Um, yeah, I, I wonder if that is going to be a debut season or if that is just. I hope they don't the, try the end of it. If they come back, it's going to be a shoe in for our highest stakes, biggest risk category, which we'll get to in a minute because yeah. there's no need. There's no, you guys right. should just take your uh, talents and, and uh, skewer something else with it because you, you, you can't do it any better than what you did. Mm -hmm. uh, American gods. Um, 
American Gods is an extremely interesting and well-made show that pushes the boundaries of what you can do on television in terms of sexuality and violence. Um, that's not to everyone's taste, but it is to my tastes. And a lot of things that like, I even thought long-term, like it's anno funny. It's not even annoying. It's just funny things I like to point out. Like you, you almost, you will never see an erect penis on HBO. You get an erect penis right, right off the bat on American gods. Uh, what network is that on? Uh, that is on stars, hmm. which okay. is a premium channel that is like, you know, but it's like the, you know, the tier beyond like HBO and cinema. Right. So. Uh, number three, the young Pope. You want to talk about the young Pope? Yeah. The young Pope. Um, uh, again, I, it's definitely going to be the best debut for this show because it will have another season. What that looks like, we don't quite know yet, but the young Pope was surprising in a lot of ways to me um first of all th the the previews made it seem like it was going to be bonkers and it turned out to be it was exactly that but it was more than that too which it's is also had a serious intellect like side it, it it is bonkers it's also beautiful it's yeah. also thought-provoking absolutely um and all those things kind of combined to me to make one hell of a season of tv and the pilot in particular like I remember watching, and I see Jude Law dressed up as the Pope, and he crawls from underneath mm -hmm. a mountain of babies yeah. to give this crazy homily as the sky opens up. And I'm like instantly, this is the this is the coolest, craziest thing that I've seen. And we did, we covered this as a lark, mm -hmm. just to kind of fuck around in early Jan or January and February of last year, when you know, right like right now, we're in kind of a content. Uh, what's the opposite of a glut? Drought. A drought. A content no. drought. Yeah, that's con good. Con content uh, fire hose. A waterfall. Uh, the glut. The glut. I guess. We don't, there's not a here. lot. There's not a lot going on in January. Is what I'm saying. Oh, oh, you're talking about now. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and it just it 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 delighted and astounded. And it was a great show. Yeah, uh, and that that show is so weird because it kept me. It it kind of went counter to a lot of the way that TV is programmed now where they want to keep you guessing with the questions you have and like the twist that they give you. Mm -hmm. This show doesn't do that. This show kind of goes the other direction mm -hmm. with it and says, we're just going to lay it all out for you and you're going to think the twists are coming and the twists don't come. <laughs> and Which is I, I, it kind of itself me, a twist, right? Exactly. Exactly. It kept me engaged in a way that um, a lot of those like, Ooh, what's going to happen next kind of uh -huh. shows don't anymore. Right. Because I'm yeah. always looking for that next twist. And then and, and and the, the twists were more of like understanding layers to characters that you didn't previously appreciate. Right. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's 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 a fun, it's a hilarious show. It is a uh, show that, that that is capable of wringing profound emotions from you. Uh, it's amazing to look at. Uh, mm -hmm. If you haven't ch ch checked that yet and you got an HBO subscription, uh, pop in HBO Go and check out The Young Pope. Uh, two, Handmaid's Tale. Um Handmaid's Tale is like a real soul seer, man. It's 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 Elizabeth Olsen living in a society which essentially enslaves women for breeding stock. And if you want to see Elizabeth uh, Moss, I said Olsen because I confused Peggy, yeah. Peggy and and her, uh, which is a that's a, that's a compliment you can play to an actor. That, uh, but yeah, Elizabeth Moss. If you want to see Elizabeth Moss like push to her limits of of what she's capable of range wise, uh, you can do a lot worse than checking out Handmaid's Tale. Uh, and then two, the deuce. No, number uh, one. Or deuce. sorry, <laughs> well, two is the deuce. It is literally yes. the deuce. Number one is the deuce. Uh, you know, I don't know why I slept on this series because I've seen David Simon make a housing initiative in Yonkers, utterly riv riveting. Mm -hmm. But like, there's still something about like, how is he ever going to say something important about society by analyzing the burgeoning porn scene in the mm -hmm. '70s? And by God, he did. Uh, and I don't think I would really want to watch a show about the porn scene in the 70s if it wasn't created by David Simon. Right. Because uh, I, I see a lot of opportunity for that to become real ridiculous real fast. Yeah, lots of sex position, whereas like the edict on top, if you, if you look at the interviews, is like David Simon wanted any of the sexuality to be... I mean, it, it, it'd be like trying to make a sandwich factory look sexy. Yeah. Like, these people are working. This is their job. It's not particularly glamorous. And sometimes it's it's horrific and, and gross. Um, but it does tell a story about masturbatoriums. Mm -hmm. I learned some new words. Masturbatoriums, 
uh, was it stand? Was it what was the stand deliver the that particular term of art where like if you were a prostitute and you could show a receipt from being arrested for the previous forty eight hours, the cops right. couldn't arrest you again. Yeah, because else all the jails would be is full of prostitutes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a great show. It's a great show. Um, <laughs> it is. That's why it's number one in this category. Best debut pilot, uh, David Simon, and uh, um, I always forget the – God damn it, I always forget the other guy. Um, <laughs> pop- so, so will history. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Pecalanos. <laughs> there you go. Pecalanos. Uh, you, did, you did it again. Um, let us move on to the beginning of the true prestige categories. Ah, uh, yes. Best female actor. Uh, again, in alphabetical order, the top ten was Aubrey Plaza as Lenny Busker from the FX show Legion, Carrie Coon as Nora Durst from The Leftovers, Elizabeth Moss as June Osborne slash Offred in The Handmaid's Tale, Grace Gummer as Dominique Dom DePero from Mr. Robot, Maggie Gyllenhaal as Eileen Candy Merrill from The Deuce, Elizabeth or Mary Elizabeth Winstead as Nikki Swango from Fargo, Merritt Weaver. It's fun to say Merritt Weaver as Mary Agnes from Godless, Millie Bobby Brown as Eleven slash Jane from Stranger Things Two, Rachel Keller as Sid Barrett also from Legion, and Rhea Seahorn as Kim from Better Call Saul. Uh, I believe it's your turn to open up an envelope. No, I just destroyed this one. Did you? Yeah, it's oh, your that's turn. Oh, that's right. You, the struggle was real. Yep. Uh, here we go. Uh, let me switch over to this. And best best female actor category for 2017. In a shocking upset, Carrie Coon is Nora Durst from The Leftovers. Very well done. Um, gee, I wonder. I wonder how the rest of the night's going to go. Huh. No, the Leftovers... No I have decided is now my favorite TV show of all time. I'm making it official. It's pretty it good has pick. dethroned the wire, um, which I didn't even know was possible when I started doing this stuff oh, so many years ago. Um, but the leftovers managed to, the, to to one up the wire by being a very. I, I think it's an important show about how we deal with grief and loss in this society and in, in, in society, um, and. It's also just extremely well made, and some of the religious themes I found fascinating due to my background. Yeah, personally, touching, and you know, the, holy Christ, the performances. Yeah, everybody, top to bottom in that show. It's just just, just an amazing cast with amazing writing, uh, and just just shooting the hell out of it. There's a particular scene where Carrie Coon at the end of a scene, like she's in a hotel that's on fire and like the, uh, the, the, the sprinkler system is flooding her and her face is down and it looks like tears are just yeah pouring out of her face. And and she's just had like an excruciating fight with Kevin. It's, it's it's, one of the most beautiful things I've seen. And it also, the moment it wasn't just like, like there's a lot of stuff in young Pope that's beautiful, but it's staged to be such. Right. This is just like everything builds up to this climactic moment, and it's it's just amazing. And this was one of one of her best seasons in the show. I think she had a lot of good yes. stuff in previous ones, but this, yes. it, you know, the finale of anything I think is going to be more important and impactful right. um, th- than what came before. And both Carrie Coon and all the other actors in the mm-hmm. show really nailed it, and Carrie Coon especially. Yeah, it's again, it's my it's it's my favorite show. Um, Maggie Gyllenhaal came in second uh, for her role as Candy on The Deuce. Um, yeah, you know she had a couple of showcase performances where she was just allowed to wind up and 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 go off, and it was pretty pretty amazing to see mm-hmm. Elizabeth Moss similarly uh, in Hands Made Tale. There was a couple. There's a scene late in the series where she just completely loses her shit at a situation that. Like, it's one of those things where it starts to get hard to watch because it's like, you know, you're just watching a person being psychologically tormented and being completely impotent about it. It's such a frustrating show in that way. Uh, Grace Gummer, really impressed as Dom on Mr. Robot. There again, like, I feel like this is the this was the year for, like, women to have these showcase performances. She gets to tell uh, Darlene off in a way to where it, it like, ver- like, like, there's a subreddit called Murdered by Words. <laughs> <laughs> this should be the top post on that her yeah. her takedown of of Darlene and her bullshit, and then Millie Bobby Brown as Eleven um, has a lot of hard stuff to do as a kid. This young lady is scary because she is yet yeah, like thirteen years old, and she's kind of reminds me a lot of a, a like a Natalie Portman who's mm-hmm. like 
how are you so good in Leon? Yeah. You shouldn't be able to, like, they're, like, I, I, they're, 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 it's, it's, it's jaw dropping how good you are in, in this role. And, uh, really, really fun to watch. Um, what should we talk to community? Do? Community yeah, agrees. Should we, uh, should we switch over to the big screen? Here? Oh shit! I completely forgot to do that. Uh, get to the correct category. I should, I should. I should. I should do that. My mouse is just all over the place. Um. Okay. Wrong category. Wrong. Why? We didn't scroll down. I did scroll down though. Maybe I didn't. It's okay. Not. Here we go. Um, the winner is, uh, La La Land. Uh, the community the community agreed with fifty three percent of All the right. respondents said Carrie Coon as Nora Durst from The Leftovers. You know, I was starting to lose faith in our listeners. But this, Never. this brought it all back. So Never. good job, listeners. Never. I feel like I feel like <laughs> that um, our fan base collectively did like a Kanye on the leftovers, where they're just mm-hmm. like, no, no, fifty three, like fifty three percent. That's an impressive win in any category. Yeah. Elizabeth Moss got fourteen, an impressive fourteen percent for Hand and Spades. Uh, Millie Bobby Brown nine percent for Stranger. Her, her role as eleven in Stranger Things. Aubrey Plaza uh, got six percent for her role as Legion, which again. If all you know of Aubrey Plaza is her ridiculous Robert De Niro shit and her scamming tickets to Hawaii and Parks and Rec, it's 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 a it's a potentially career defining performance that she puts on in this crazy little show about mutants. And then Rhea, uh, Rhea Seahorn, I'm not that's not right. It's Ray. It's Ray. Ray yeah. Seahorn. I'm sorry. I do that every year. Uh, on Better Call Saul for five percent, who did a great job. Yeah. Um, some of her best work, I think, was aided and embedding by stellar editing. That certainly helped, yeah. Um, there's a particular scene that I want to spoil in season three that is just, like, one of the few things that, like, caught me by surprise in the moment. Mm-hmm. And, um, but, but she's great. Yeah, I think a lot of the stuff that she had to do was very subtle this year. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, she, she really nailed it. Uh, other category in this received a scant 2% of the vote. And, um... I think the, it, the there's for Queen Elizabeth in that uh, the Netflix show The Crown, and there was one for the protagonist of uh, Outlander. Hmm. Okay. So there you go. Uh, let us move on to the rest of the show as okay. I try to fumble for what mouse I'm I'm, I'm going for. Um, we're talking now about uh, the biggest surprise, the biggest surprise category, um, and <laughs> yeah. You want to start at the bottom at number yeah, five? Yeah, at number five. Okay. This is a commission podcast. Yeah, it's American Gangster, which uh, wouldn't be a big surprise to people who have seen it before. It shouldn't have been a big surprise to us. shouldn't have been a big surprise. It has a lot of big names attached. Um, it's a subject matter that we already know we're interested in. Uh, but just how good it was um, and and how little I had heard about it, you know? Like, yeah. I don't hear American Gangster talked about in the same tones as, like, The Godfather or whatever. And... I kind of think it should be. Yeah, we talked in deliberations how, like, I, I mean, I can easily call this the like, the black Godfather, uh-huh. but that's kind of like damning it with comparison. I'm saying it's, it's the black God. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's just that, that to me, it's very high praise to give it to give to something. Um, right. And it, it, it's it's that it's exact same feel of um, very powerful head of this family. Some of his family is their chuckleheads. Um, some of them are, are people to take seriously. It's got great performances top to bottom. It's got one, an, an early performance by, um, uh, God damn it. Uh, it's a black tower guy. Uh, Idris Elba. Black tower guy. Got a very early, very, dark tower what, guy. The black, t- <laughs> did I, oh, oh my God. Yeah, oh I'm no. just fucking, yeah, I'm, oh no. I am a crypto racist. I've, I've tried to keep it under wraps for this long. Um, but uh, I done fucked up, and I'm sorry. I I will I will donate to the appropriate uh, black charity afterwards. God damn it! Get me out of this, American Gangster, uh, American Vandal, American Vandal. Yeah. Like I vandalize racial relations in America. Uh, American Vandal, the story that of uh, of a young man who vandalized a bunch of shows or a bunch of a bunch of a bunch of fucking cars with dicks. Yeah, Jim, talk for a minute. Uh, American Vandal. Came out of nowhere. Uh, American Vandal was not on my radar, as most Netflix shows are not. Yeah, I, I got a text from my buddy saying, "Dude, watch American Vandal," and that's one of the things I wanted to say for its its debut category is like this thing had one episode to catch me because mm-hmm. like if this thing was anything less than than funny or interesting, I was gonna be like, "Okay, thanks for the suggestion, jackass." I'll 
I'll, I'll keep my, my own counsel as a professional TV critic now. And I think the, the another reason it was a big surprise is because the trailer didn't really appeal that much to me. Yeah. Uh, the trailer made it seem a little more serious on the subject that was ridiculous, yeah. but like a more serious view into it. I, and I feel like that was a failing and something that turned me off of it. And when I finally went to watch it, I'm like, this is so much better than the trailer gave it credit for. I remember the like when we were watching the trailer because that's what you do on Netflix. Like it just automatically shows it. Right, you can't um, not watch it. Uh, me and Seth are debating like, is this a real? Like I don't remember hearing this on the news because it did look serious. I do right. think that towards the halfway point of the trailer, it becomes clear. Well, I never that, got that far in because it's like, uh, well, I'm not interested in this because like, because it's like this is either uh, a farce or it's just it's going to be the most ridiculous true crime I've ever heard of. Right. Um. So but yeah, huge, it's a huge surprise for me. It's great. Star Trek Discovery was yeah. a big surprise because Star Trek was pretty good. It, it was pretty good, yeah. And I I had not experienced a good Star Trek in about a decade, maybe more. I mean, even the movie, like I like the original Star Trek uh -huh. reboot. Yeah. I thought increasingly they got more and more wrongheaded and dumb. Mm -hmm. Um and like you got to go back to Deep Space Nine for me to watch a televised Star Trek that right. I found entertaining. Um, so Star Trek Discovery, the fact that it was pretty good. In fact, at the at the at the end of the first episode, I'm like, <laughs> Star Trek doesn't have the balls to pay any of this off. It's going to be reset yeah. button and Planet of the Week. Here, just she'll just be a watch. captain in episode two. Yep, like <laughs> yep. And I was shocked that they actually uh, committed to those things and 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 the like like lived in the hole they dug in. Yeah, um, yeah. It was it was a lot better. There's a I've got minor gripes like didn't like I I I think that the Klingon reimagining was stupid and needless and just mm. just completely you know it's this this continuity is already continuity is already a swiss cheese matrix mm -hmm. and it just blew more holes in it but whatever uh the klingon subtitles suck too but other than that i really liked it all right number two mr robot again season two i did not like season two about broke us yeah so coming back with the season three i was very skeptical yeah um thinking this might be the season that i check out i yep. might be done with the podcast and every episode it just kept getting better and right. better and better right? until we got to the end of the season, and I said, holy shit, that was a great season of TV. And I f kind of felt chagrined that we might have turned people off of Mr. Robot with their, like, cause I, but I do think that season two has a lot of unfortunate issues. Mm -hmm. um, it would be, it'd be fascinating if this is all, like, I can't wait to see when Mr. Robot's over, if it all holds up, and then the tale of the making of it, because... I would love to know what the hell Sam Esmail was thinking in season two. Yeah. Did he have like a hat? Did, did he have like this, this middle act? that was like a half season long and he didn't know, like he didn't, wasn't sure, but like, you know, I, I don't know. Like, like yeah. I, I, I it, it'd be fascinating, but it was surprising because it was amongst the best things we saw on television this year. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the young Pope, the biggest surprise, number one, because again, thought this was going to be a ridiculous show of, uh, Jude Law, handsome Jude Law, prancing around in pope robes, mm -hmm. and it was totally that. Yeah, and we had a lot of fun with that. But it's also a really interesting look at 21st century faith and Christianity yeah. and what it, that all means, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as as something to engage. And that's the thing because I, I remember middle of the season thinking, asking on our our, our bi weekly show where we were catching up with me, you, and Cecily, like, are Catholics watching this? Because, like, as an atheist, I'm digging it, which I, so I assume that, like, serious Catholics would, would eschew it. And I'm sure some did. But, like, I was surprised by how many uh, Catholics enjoyed watching it as well. So, biggest surprise of last year, the young Pope, congratulations. Uh, this next category, Jim, might need a little bit of a explaining. Highest stakes slash biggest risk. Um, this is stuff that I don't think really needed. To, well, it's a lot of things. So, first of all, uh, it's a category where we say, hey, this thing didn't really need to be done, but they're going to go ahead and do it anyway. Right. And it's such a beloved thing amongst its fans yeah. that the only potential here is that it's either amazing and mm -hmm. they love it, or it's less than amazing and everybody hates it. Like the Blues and Brothers 2000. the legacy of that franchise. Blues Brothers 2000 was a highest stakes, biggest risk that completely fell on its face. Right. It, it besmirched the rep the Star Wars prequels. Yeah. Anytime that something is considered like a complete thing that's amazing and someone years later decides to remake it, yep. um, like Rick and Morty season three, 
certainly high stakes because it's so universally well regarded that season three could not be as good. And then what mm-hmm. does that do to reputation of the creators and the show? But it was a foregone conclusion. Yeah. It made a bunch of money. Adult Swim brought it back. Uh, Star Wars also at this point, The Force Awakens, high stakes, big risk. Mm-hmm. Now it's just you're going to get a Star Wars every year whether you like it or not. Yeah. So it, there's there's there, the, the risk and the stakes are kind of eliminated, like, eliminated largely. Yeah, if you didn't like this year's, wait for next year. You might like it. Right. You know? So with that said, let's take it from bottom order up. Uh, Mystery Size Theater 3000. Uh, Cult following for here, this thing. So there's several reasons why this is a big risk and high stakes. Number one, the original people or some of the original people are still doing this thing on riff tracks. Yeah. They're still making their livelihoods doing this thing. And this was a reboot to go back to the, the, the old, the old style less, I guess, big block. Cause that's what riff tracks does. Now they do the Harry Potters and the star Wars and the star Treks, the big, mm-hmm. big budget stuff. Um, go back to doing just schlock. Yep. With a completely new cast, get Felicia Day in there, get Patton Oswalt to play the bads, uh, get some kind of schlubby, doughy guy to be the the dumb yokel, get diff- recast the robots. Tons of room for controversy and this sucking. And honestly, the first one is pretty rough. Like they 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 fell into the like trying to jam too many riffs, so none of them individually land. But mm-hmm. there's a couple of real gems, like the Italian Hercules, is like a top ten <laughs> mystery science theater. 3000 of all time as far as i'm concerned huh. so i felt like it was a it was a high stakes big risk that completely paid off uh you want to talk about john wick 2 yeah, yeah number four john wick 2 uh john wick was entirely self-contained um and it was incredible for what it was it Just was a not based on it was action it, movie it's not based on a comic book or a property there's no real no. obvious reason why you would run this back other than to make more money right which is always a high stakes big risk proposition super risky um you can shit the money bed and then what are you going to do john wick but in this case it absolutely paid off i thought john wick 2 was as good as the first one and it yeah. sets up the franchise to become that you know to become yes. a franchise as opposed to just now you movie. expect it now right. it's, uh, john wick 3 will be ineligible because yeah. we they're 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 the risk is pre-built into the fact that they did the the second one yep stranger things too uh a self-contained story told extremely well by very young creators who this was the first thing they ever did this Mm -hmm. is the thing this passion project they've been noodling on for a decade and now you're going to follow it up in a year's time go yeah true detective season two right (laughs) that's the that's the risk and the stakes it is yeah and they fucking they fucking nailed it and this show trades largely on nostalgia Yes. which can grow tiring if, right. it's, if it's so distilled. And it just gets forced in. Right. Yeah. Um, and the fact that it worked as well as it did, in, in my opinion, just as well as the first season, right. is is super impressive. Yeah. Uh, Blade Runner is another one of the kind of the poster child for this category. Um, Blade Runner 2049. Mm-hmm. You know, Blade Runner is still widely regarded as one of the best science fiction films of all time. Uh, it's got one of the best leading men of all time. It's got just a, u- a unique dystopian look that history did not bear out. <laughs> <laughs> sure. There's a version of America that uh, Ridley Scott was going for that did not come to pass. Mm-hmm. Uh, why? Why? Why fucking make a new Blade Runner? Yeah, there's no need. There was that's no, why it's the highest stakes. There's no need, but they did it, and it was it was not the same as the first Blood R- Blade Runner, but it's pretty fucking good. Yeah, it was really good. My biggest complaint is I wish I didn't know Harrison Ford was in this movie. Yeah. Because there's no, like, my, the biggest villain in 2017, as far as I'm concerned, other, if we, if we take out, like, real life people, uh, mm-hmm. are the people that cut fucking movie trailers. Yeah. Like, stop spoiling signature moments of your films that should be a surprise, like the Hulk coming out of nowhere in Thor, uh, Harrison Ford coming out of nowhere in Blade Runner. Because all of Blade Runner, I'm just waiting for Harrison Ford to come up. Right. And every scene, like 15 minutes before it shows up, I can, I can, I can feel his footsteps in the background as he's, as he's coming out of it. I can literally hear his trailer door ba- bang open, him grumbling down the steps, and him shuffling his feet to the set. Yep. And I don't want to hear that. I want to just be like, holy shit. Like, imagine, like, do you remember in First Night? Like, that's a shitty, schlocky movie. Mm-hmm. But when, like, or no, that's a bad example. Because Sean Connery was like, 
I'm trying to think of a good example of like stunt casting where you get to the end of the movie and you're just delighted that this person is in this little cameo role. Yeah, yeah, I can't think of any specific examples, but we'll never get that because these fuckers yeah. uh they act I don't know. I don't, well, every, I don't know. everything is about nobody wants to let anything build into something great. They want it to be great immediately. Star Wars, honestly, I might have liked it better if had I not known the two signature will they won't they twists that were coming yeah. like i i you know again i'm not a professional trailer maker but do better mm. number one high stakes biggest risk are we just trying to shove the leftovers in as many categories to get wins yeah, as we can uh, but i will not apologize for it well so it, defend this as a high stakes big risk so season two left the leftovers in a place where it could have just been the end of the series. It, was and it a, would have been incredibly satisfying. It was a very satisfying... And, and honestly, all the seasons of The Leftovers, because they didn't know if they were coming back. They never knew right. when they were filming whether they get renewed. They all served as a self-contained series finale and would have been yeah. eminently satisfying for that. Absolutely. And and season two ended, it ended really, really well. Uh, the other complicating factor here is Damon Lindelof himself because yes. of his history with Lost and ending series. And these mystery boxes these that he, mystery can, boxes. That he and constructs. So when, when, he, when they announced, hey, we're going to do a season three of this, it's like, you already stuck this landing. You don't want to get back up on the bars, man. Yeah. You've already, get, you've already got a 10 from the judges. Yeah. Uh, now, now you're just trying to go for another 10? Right. And huge, huge risk, in my opinion, because at, even at the end of season two, it was flirting to be one of the best shows I had ever seen. Right. Um, now they come back with season three, and they end up nailing it. Huge risk, but huge payoff, Especially too. since, you know, a lot of the... D Damon Lindelof said he would never answer the central mysteries about the show, that they were intentionally mysteries. Yeah. How do you wrap something up that vague and... Yeah open to interpretation how do you satisfying uh in that and by god he did it like and if you don't it's potentially a career killer yes like yes. that's the scary thing here. yeah especially if more people were watching leftovers but for the million or so people that watched the show and loved it like it's i've never seen anything like it where the fan base is kind of evenly distributed over how they thought interpreted the ending and mm -hmm. usually one camp likes it one camp doesn't Sure. Yeah. Uh, this can like both everyone kind of seemed to like whether you what you decided to believe happened in the final episode and in the final season largely left up to your individual interpretation, your life experiences and your relationship to the show. And they were all equally satisfying. Yeah, that's fucking hard to do. That's a big risk that the whole team took and they fucking blew the doors off of it. The leftovers. Amazing show. Twenty seventeen. Uh, we are going on to best male actor. Uh, Jim, this is your envelope. I believe it is. Uh, let's talk about uh, the nominees. Uh, B.D. Wong as White Rose slash Zhang and Mr. Robot. Bobby Cannavale as Irving and Mr. Robot. David Harbour as Chief Jim Hopper in Stranger Things. David Thewlis as VM Varga from Fargo. Gary Carr as CC. Uh, from The Deuce, Jeff Daniels as Frank Griffin from Godless, Jude Law as The Pope from The Young Pope, Justin Thoreau as Kevin Garvey Jr. in The Leftovers, Michael McKean as Chuck from Better Call Saul, Noah Schnapp as Will Byers from Stranger Things 2, Jim with the envelope. What what How, how do we make out here? This, I'm, one's, I'm on, this one's really well sealed. I'm on pins and needles. I don't know if this one's coming open. <laughs> Uh, oh, the suspense. The crowd's murmuring. They want to know who fucking won. And the winner of the 2017 Bald Move Award for Best Male Actor goes to Justin Thoreau as Kevin Garvey Jr. for The Leftovers. Justin, Justin Thoreau. Very just, good. Just amazing job, Justin. Just, uh, uh. Yeah. No, it's, it's tough to take anything away from him. I will say he was working across the table from the best actress of Bald Move's 2017 Baldies. Yep. Uh, so maybe he had a little crutch to lean on there, but he also, he also rocked it. Uh, he also was, I mean, Justin Thoreau from the first season to the end was just fully amazing and never gave a false note. He mm -hmm. was, he was badass in some scenes. He was contemptible. He was miserable. He was pitiable. He was inspiring. He was so many different things. And it's Justin Thoreau who... I'd only noticed from, like, weirdo roles he had in, like, Zoolander and shit previously. Right. Like, I was just completely unprepared for how amazing 
and and beautiful a creation he made of of Kevin Garvey Jr. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I yeah, I can't I, I I cannot say enough good about all the, this show. Goddamn. Um, shall we go to the big screen to talk about the other results? Yeah, sounds uh, good. David Thulis, VM Varga, and Fargo. What do you want to say about David? Uh, David is the only actor on television this year that made me physically ill. Yeah. <laughs> with his performance his villainy in fargo his sheer the sheer banality of his evil mm-hmm. the the chillingness of it the the off-putting affectations of his character uh i mean i it defies description like you have to watch the show uh to to understand what we're talking about cuz uh, to me he is the gr- He's probably the greatest villain I've seen on television since, like, Breaking Bad. Like, I have to yeah. go to, like, Gus Fring to think of a better, more terrifying, more well-realized uh, uh, a character. And it largely rests on David Thewlis, who I've also seen be incredibly warm and mentoring mm-hmm. in, uh, you know, like, fucking Harry Potter. So, like, yeah, just playing just, just, just playing outright villain. Um, it's been, like, since, like, fucking Dragonheart. <laughs> Since Dragon I've seen him, him play like a just complete shit, huh. and this is a com- this is yeah. a much more complete shit. Oh yeah, uh, I used to hate David Thewlis. Like really? like him being in Dragonheart, and then in the uh, he was also in a do- uh, uh, the Island of Doctor Moreau. I'm hmm. uh, just like, who is this guy? What is this goofy redheaded fuck? What is going on? And you have completely proved me wrong in the last decade with Professor Lupin and uh, V M Varga. Uh, let's talk about B.D. Wong as White Rose slash Zhang in Mr. Robot. Yeah, uh, an incredible dual character performance here. Uh, there were a lot of dual character performances this year. Uh, this, in my opinion, was the best because it was the hardest to pull off, I think. Um, yeah. And and it's it's played by B.D. Wong. The, the White Rose Zhang um, counterparts are played with such seriousness. Right. Um, it never feels like one of them is given short shrift, you know, yeah. or like they cast him to play one of those characters, but not the other. Yeah. Uh, he so effortlessly blends into the two that, I, I mean, I lose that character. I lose that actor in that character. Yeah. But BD Wong is a gay man playing a trans woman, playing a straight Chinese foreign minister. Yes. And <laughs> at, at the, times the, playing all the those the differences yeah. <laughs> between those characters and the work he does vocally and mm-hmm. like the, with physicality um and the fact that none like not, it's not ridiculous like that mm-hmm. that's a role that could fucking be ridiculous if it Absolutely. was played slightly false and it's 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 great. It's just such a it's it, and I can't believe this is the guy who was flipping dinosaur eggs in Jurassic Park. Yeah. Like, that's literally the one thing I've ever seen him in. 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah. 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 So um, there you go. Jude Law is the Pope uh, mm-hmm. for the young Pope. I yeah, Again, I, it, I... He makes that performance feel effortless, doesn't he? he and it's, it's, it's really complicated because he's tormented. He's also childish. He's yeah. also... Uh, he's pious. He's also vulgar. Like, there's so many things. He, he's petty. And officious, but also funny and warm. Uh, he Jude Law is all things to all people in the Young Pope, or at least for this person. Mm. Um, I freaking love it. And then the double dipping for Mr. Robot, Bobby Cannavale. <laughs> yeah, uh, he's a monster. I first saw Bobby Cannavale in I think season three of Boardwalk Empire, playing an insane uh, Italian hitman, essentially. Mm-hmm. And I've seen him also since then in a lot of different, like he plays a goofy, like MILF hunter in the station agent. Yeah. And I've seen him play like, uh, like a lot. He's like, he's much more of a character actor than I initially presumed. And here, like he's able to kind of bring all those threads together. And he plays this kind of, uh, this, he plays a used car salesman who's also an accessory to the dark army. This, this mm-hmm. underground Chinese hacker sect, ruthless hacker sect that's built around the cult of BD Wong. Um, and you know, there's like a lot of twists and turns in that, that whole relationship too. Yeah. Super cool. Mm -hmm. Good job, Bobby. Uh, let's talk about the community. Uh, community again, stands with one, uh, Good Justin job, Justin Thoreau, thirty nine percent of the vote for his work on Kevin Jar- Garvey Jr. and the Leftovers. So say we all. Mm-hmm. Michael McKean, uh, who was number seven on our list, got fourteen percent of the uh, vote as 
uh, the living embodiment of the hashtag fuck Chuck uh-huh. and better call Saul. Um, he deserves it. He, deserves, uh, he was, it he's was real good. Great performance. Yeah. Real good. Uh, David Thewlis, uh, number two on our list, number three in the community's heart, 8% with his role as the evil Varga on Fargo. Uh, Sheriff David Harbour. Uh, <laughs> Sheriff Jim Har- Hopper, played by David Harbour on uh, Stranger Things 2, 7%. And Noah Schnapp as Will Byers on Stranger Things 2, 6%. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, David Harbour's a really cool guy. I can't wait to see him in hell, boy. He is like a big teddy bear, but he's also like a badass. And he's also like a really good dad struggling with a rebellious teenage daughter who has unfathomably powerful mind powers. It's there's a lot there's a lot in that role that's interesting. And poor poor Noah Schnapp playing poor Will Byers. Yeah. He's the series punching bag. He is. I'm still waiting for him to join the boys on an adventure. He, he gets stuffed in an internet interdimensional locker in season one, uh-huh. and is seen from for like 30 seconds. And in this season, he's just he's tortured just tortured by an interdimensional demon. Like I haven't seen yeah. a little kid play just sheer existential dread and torment since like Halle Joel Osment uh-huh. in, in the, the the Sixth Sense. Yeah, like that same kind of a haunted quality. And uh, again, how are you so young and you are so good? Um, I suspect some kind of satanic ritual and foul play. Uh, we should move on to the next uh, next category. Yeah. Uh, this is a high – wait, we already did highest stakes, biggest yeah. risk. I'm on the wrong screen. We are now ready for worst disappointment. Uh, let's do this bottom up. Number five, Alien Covenant. Jim, would you like to talk about that? Uh, man, Alien Covenant – is just a series of unfortunate events. This is a, a series of stupid events. Yeah, big risk, like big risk, uh, high stakes, fell on your face. Absolutely. I mean, it, it relies. Its plot relies on every character doing incredibly stupid things, and I get it. It's a horror movie, but I thought Aliens was more than that. Um, and I was a at, I was Alien a, was more than that. As I a was an apologist for Prometheus because I thought right. that there was some really cool big ideas and some interesting things about. I don't know, science fiction that Ridley Scott was capable of saying, and I was thinking the Alien Covenant was going to be the thing that brought it all together and also simultaneously brought it back to its roots as a scary alien film, and it yeah. did nothing. I, I think there was some interesting stuff in there, like uh, with um, what's what's his name, the, the android... Oh, yeah, uh, Aspender? Yeah, with Aspender being like this ultimate evil monster... Uh-huh. I thought there was some kind of cool stuff Another in there, dual some role. cool ideas. Another dual role. Is it data lore, data role, lore role? It was, yeah. Um, but ultimately, that movie just fell apart for yeah. me. Yeah, like the characters were impossible to sympathize with yeah. because they're all literally the stupidest people uh, born of man and woman. Right, like, and everyone should know better. Yeah, it's it's like every single it, – it's like – trying to emotionally connect the teenagers in a Friday the 13th movie. <laughs> right. You're rooting for the bad. I, I, you start rooting for the robot and the monsters, and I'm not sure that's what you're supposed to do. Yeah. Uh, Suburbicon. Suburbicon was a massive disappointment because I missed the first showing because my car broke down, uh, and I heroically moved my schedule around so I could see the show and, and do it like on a Monday makeup, and it's had a huge pedigree. It's directed. It's written by the Coen brothers. It stars Matt Damon. It's directed by George Clooney. How the hell can all that go wrong? Well, you'd have to watch Suburbicon to find out like what a really oblivious, wrong-headed take on racism in America and the quiet desperation of a 50s sub. I mean, there's there's one good thing about this movie, and it's the little boy's performance. Um, and I can't really say any more of that mass of spoilers, but Suburbicon... We, it should have been better given who 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 made it. Hmm. Uh, let's talk about gold. Yeah, gold gold's a tough one. Um, I, I think it had a really exciting concept for me. Um, like this idea of uh, kind of the creation of an empire by one one guy. Like it's it's a lot of the stuff that I you know in my most aspirational moments I think oh maybe we could do this kind of thing with bald move right yeah um and, and the scenario like being in this South American country um, where governments can essentially uh, do whatever the hell they want mm-hmm. and they can roll in on businesses and say we are the business now um, how do you how do you fight those sorts of things and I I think they touched on a lot of that stuff, but they never really went all in on it. And I 
I was looking for a little bit more out of this movie, so it was pretty disappointing. And you see, you know, uh, Matthew McConaughey, and you want him to do well. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was hoping this movie is going to be the fusion of like Indiana Jones, Romancing the Stone, and Wolf of Wall Street. And yeah. it was not. It, it it was. I mean, it wasn't not. It reminded me a lot of like uh, Monument Men. Like it's mm-hmm. kind of an interesting story that's told in the blandest, most paint by numbers, boring way possible. Yeah. Like, how do you make a story about this crackpot team of World War II guys that are trying to save all these priceless works of art in front of the, the the, the Nazi horde? Uh, well, watch a mon- Monument Men to see it done. And the same thing. How do you tell this swashbuckling story of this guy who's who is this geologist and he's looking? He's he's literally a gold hunter. And mm-hmm. well, watch the movie. Uh, cure for wellness. Ooh, this third act is is one of the worst third acts I've seen all year. I, I remember when I this first came on a radar, I saw the trailer and I I, I I texted you and I said, watch this trailer. It's the first movie since like the Matrix that gave me this kind of like what the hell is going on? Yeah. Crazy mind bending possibilities. Uh the movie looks great. It's got a really interesting lead uh young actor. And as you say, it completely falls down and punches itself in the dick in the third act. Yeah, like it doesn't, and that's the it thing. doesn't know what tone it's trying. The to whole strike. time I'm thinking, okay, I, I'm 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 engaged, I'm interested. I, I they they clearly want me to think this, but there's going to be some other thing. And then it's the it's just the first thing, which is the and least interesting. And thing. it's weirder and stupider too. It's yeah, like, it's all of the the bad things they can do in a third act. Yeah, and all the tension that they have kind of been building over the first half of the film just 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 sinks and deflates like a shitty souffle. Yeah. Uh, and then we come to the Aronofsky disaster. Mother with an exclamation point. Yeah. The more I thought about this movie, the less I liked it. Uh, it's unfortunate because it, the reason why this is such a big disappointment is the pedigree behind it, like you were saying about Suburbicon, right? Uh, Darren Aronofsky has made one of my favorite films uh, in Requiem for a Dream. And I looked at this trailer and I said, this has got to be crazy and this has got to be really good. Yeah. Um, and it was crazy. In, in a lot of respects, it was crazy, but it ultimately, it was so obvious in its themes. I think. Um, I mean, that's the thing. The w- sub- when you take a second and you you stand back and say, "What is this movie doing?" It's kind of all on the surface, and and I don't think that's what I was looking for out of this movie. No, at the subtext is screaming text in this case, and he's yeah. made like you know, Black Swan, Requiem for a Dream, the the Wrestler, some of my all time favorite fantastic. movies. Through a, a pretty wide swath of like an emotional palette, yeah. uh, you know something about the torment of being a ballerina, and then also the torment of being a professional wrestler. What do those things With have the in torment common? Of being a drug addict. <laughs> other, other than they're just really great portrayals of the these roles and, and relentlessly watchable and interesting. And the mother, like I was into it, yeah. and like it looked beautiful, and I kept waiting for it to turn into something more than just just lazy retelling of essentially a creation myth of specific judeo-christian myth from uh creation uh, judeo-christian cre- judeo-christian creation myth mm-hmm. from the bible and it didn't like that's all there is to that movie and, and it it had the moment from darren aronofsky where everything goes off the rails and yeah. you say what the hell is happening but you just didn't but care didn't, at that point. right it didn't matter it wasn't it wasn't enough to pull that movie out like if i gave a a a a one shit about jennifer lawrence or javier bardem in that film i would have been like probably super in, but there's no reason to care because these characters are such archetypes and like the the fucking Jungian sense of the word, uh-huh. like a mother. It is a she is a mother, yeah. and he is this f- creator father god. And who cares? Yeah, it's a disappointment. It, and 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 I I was pissed off watching it. Uh, let's talk about Return to Form. Uh, so this is this is for a category for shows and movies that took a stumble, and you're ready to write them off. Uh, but they get back up and they impress you. They yeah. they are they go they 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 had a they a, get the a little, eye of the tiger, little slump, but they come back like Rocky mm-hmm. and they fucking beat Drago. They beat Mr. T eventually. They beat everyone apparently. They beat them all, yeah. um, except for Creed. Uh, number five, it's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Again, Always Sunny has never sucked, but the last few seasons in my mind were starting to get pretty treadmilly and relying way too much on Charlie's Bird Law. Mm-hmm. kind of like self-referential oh here's the mcpoyle episode 
and just didn't have anything new or fresh or interesting to say. And for whatever reason, this final season, they mu- they had the creative juices going, and it was both hysterical and kind of thought provoking as far as these crazy ass comedies go, and just just really funny. Um, I haven't seen it yet because I wait to catch them on Netflix. But yeah, so you when the new season comes out, which I mean, there's a whole it's a whole yeah. shit show because like they still are they don't know whether Glenn Howerton's coming back and in mm-hmm. what role if he's just going to be behind the scenes or because he left. Uh, uh, Dennis left the show. Yeah, at the end of last season, and what are they going to do with all that? I don't know. It's just it's interesting. Uh, Star Trek Discovery. Yeah, we kind of talked about this already, but Star Trek had a big lull for for me, especially because I was not a huge fan of the new movies. Mm-hmm. Um, but like you, I think the first one, it, it had enough of of what. I guess what I was looking for in a Star Trek reboot, which is the actors kind of nailing the roles, and they did. They, they nailed the, they the cast was it. amazing. Yeah. But I ultimately was not interested in the stories they were telling with those right. new movies. So for right. me, those are kind of absent. And then you look back at Voyager and Enterprise, and those are shit shows, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, Star Trek has had a very long run of being bad mm-hmm. uh, when it comes to television. So Star Trek Discovery coming back was surprising that it was even passable as a as a TV show I would want to watch. Yeah. Uh, uh, and we'll probably have more coverage. I know we cut, we did a few bald move TVs on that. I think when we get all caught up with it, that we would like to talk about it in total, but like, yeah. you know, we're very impressed. Uh, Spider-Man homecoming. Mm-hmm. Uh, Spider-Man had been abused by Sony for a long time with endless, yeah. meaningless reboots with, uh, Sam Raimi increasingly being detached from the process. Like Spider-Man two was one of the best superhero movies of all time, and then Spider-Man 3 was not, and then the Amazing Spider-Man series has just got off. I didn't even see the second yeah, one. The I see every stuff, fucking comic book movie ever made, and I did not see Amazing Spider-Man 2 with yeah. Jamie Foxx as a bolt of a lightning or whatever the fuck. Okay. <laughs> Spider-Man Homecoming was magical. Like, yeah. it's 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 better than all the other Spider-Men that came before it, and those Spider-Men were pretty fucking good. A couple of them, yeah. You find a, you find a kid that can actually play a teenage Peter Parker and nail that kind of like weird devil may care kind of like patter. You cast an aging uh, a Batman slash Birdman as the vulture, mm-hmm. uh, uh, f- f- Michael Keaton. It's it's just I mean Marvel like this, Marvel movies are always good, but this one was like one of the special ones. It's like the first Iron Man, the first Avengers, where it's I think I think it's great. Uh, two Fargo. Uh, yeah, Fargo had a. Um, not quite as strong season two. Like no, season one was really great. Season two is good. There's this one part yeah. where it it's like a horse that threw us, man. Yeah, that, I think it's the ninth episode or something. Yeah, it's, it really just kicked me off the back of it. I'm not even. And gonna I say didn't it's even want to get back on because a lot of people enjoyed it, but right. it just for us was like just such a a wrong headed fish NATO seven thirty seven over ABQ moment that. Uh, it really, I started, I started worrying about Noah Hawley in general. Uh, like, like what is he, is he just like a fucking brain? Is he just a slightly more sophisticated, uh, Scott Gimple that he just can brainlessly remix better things. Right. And it fools people because it's aping the Coen brothers style. And they've got such a diverse, amazing catalog. That if you cherry pick the best moments and shove them into one thing, it's so unusual and weird that people are going to watch it. Mm-hmm. Fargo season three Started down that path. It did, yeah. But right around episode three, completely elevated and, and uh, you know, with great villains, uh, great casting, great performances, something important, I think, to say about our present point in history and our relationship with money and truth. Uh, stunning return to form. Yeah, I agree. Finally, Mr. Robot. Mr. Robot's the most obvious one. Broken I mean, record time. I really did not like season two. Yes. Um like I said, to the point where we weren't sure if we were going to cover it if season three was bad. Uh, so for season three to be one of the best things I watched this year, uh, that's a serious return to form in my mind. Yep. Uh, which brings us to the return of the form of the end of the podcast or the end of the award ceremony, which is the opening of the best 2017 Bald Move Award for Best Drama. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jim, would you like to read the... Uh, would you like to read the categories in, in alphabetical order? The nominees? Absolutely. The nominees for Bald Moves 2017 Best Drama are The Deuce, The Expanse, Fargo, Game of Thrones, Godless, Handmaid's Tale, Mr. Robot, The Leftovers, Stranger Things 2, 
and the young pope. And the winner, the winner is the leftovers. Is twenty seventeen bald move overall best drama award winner to most prestigious category, well deserved. I mean, yeah. Can we can we heap any more praise yeah, upon this show? I mean, once you say it's now your all time favorite show, no, no, there's no. Have more you done any thought? Because thought, you, what, what is this it your, thing? Is it your favorite show? Did it dethrone Breaking Bad? If I had not wa- gone back and watched the pilot, like the opening ten minutes of Breaking Bad, uh-huh. I would probably declare yes, it is in fact my f- new favorite show. Mm-hmm. But now, like. Have you seen the episode a, called International Assassin, Jim? I have seen that episode. You have okay. multiple times, okay. as a matter of fact. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's, first it's ten just, minutes above Breaking Bad. Okay. All right. They're different things. <laughs> they're different things. That is they're true. both amazing. Uh, I, I love them both equally. Um, my my children. So are they? You're saying they're one A and one B? Sure. Which is one A? In no particular order. <laughs> uh let's see let's go let's talk about the number two stranger things two um you know that's the thing is i thought the leftovers just run away and be like head and shoulders above but like shows kept being good uh stranger things two is an amazing show that were i mean like like these next four would have been tougher and i would have probably struggled with them more except for the leftovers is such the obvious win yeah but stranger things two mr robot which is our third one the deuce which is number four and fargo number five those they i mean they're almost interchangeable um it it depends on what you like and probably what generation you were born into and your affinity for technology and david simon shit but based on what you like more because you can't go wrong all of these all these shows in the top five are just amazing yeah. uh, a couple of things that narrowly like the you know game of thrones who's perennially in our top ten top five frequently when you know getting the top crown mm-hmm. barely eked out a number 10 list that's part game of thrones stumbling it's part these other shows just really uh you know pouring on the steam but what a great year for television yeah what a great year for television and what's so funny is we went back to last year because there's a lot of shows that didn't didn't make it last year like the leftovers didn't make the cutoff but like it it would this this top five would have kicked the shit out of top 10 of last year Absolutely. Uh, let's talk about the community choice. Uh, let's go to the big screen and look at that. Uh, so we've got the community. 40% votes the leftovers at the number one show. I'm shocked. All right. I'm shocked. Be- because that our the, audience. The Game of Thrones juggernaut. The Game yeah. of Thrones audience. Like, the leftovers audience is way bigger than I possibly expected. Sure. I mean, we had it like. It became our third biggest show this we year. We had 10% of the total audience yep. for this show listening to this goddamn podcast, which <laughs> yeah. is crazy. It's crazy. We had 100,000 people watching, listening to this thing off of like a million people watching. Mm-hmm. Game of Thrones has, a, like, depending on who you believe, 15 to 100 million people watching and got 19% of the vote, which, again, you know, and, and it's a. It did take a stumble this year. It had some problems rounding into what I assume the Double Ds want to be the final shape. Mm-hmm. It's still an entertaining season with a lot of great moments. It is. Um, and that reflects in the community vote. We have a massive audience for that show, and it's a great show, 19%. Uh, they also said Stranger Things, Mr. Robot, and The Handmaid's Tale, which is number seven on our list. That's a respectable community top five as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it's not that much different from our top five other than – game of thrones being being re- overrepresented uh also there was um there are four votes for other uh two of them were for westworld and the oj simpson story which were not even eligible for this year's no westworld did we, didn't did, air did, this year did we did we remember to um do, do the... this is a bunch of fancy camera moves that it's not that's not that catch up on um did we do the 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 did we do the community choice on comedy we did, didn't we? I actually think, I think so. Yeah, 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 yeah. We actually threw because I was worried when I saw the community choice on that that we'd forgotten. Um, but I actually put them on the list because I I know myself. I know myself really well. Uh, so it's it's interesting. I so I want to say first of all, congratulations to the leftovers and all of our winners. Uh, second of all, like this was the first time we did like a write in type of strategy. And next year, because what I saw is I wonder if some of these write ins would have done better, um, because it's like. You know, you, you're just eyes going through all these shows, and then you got other. And, like, if you're not immediately have a show 
Like, oh my God, I can't believe they didn't do Veep. Or, oh my God, I can't believe they didn't do Curb. Or, oh my God, I can't... Like, if, if that's just not right in your forefront, you're probably going to select one of the, uh, the, 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 the main options. Right. I think next year I'd like to do a two-step process where we just have, you know, a nominee... Like you just guys just just as a blank text box for these six categories, you tell us who you think are the best ones or your top ten five, and then we can take the community voting from that. Because I don't think it's fair to put stuff like Veep and Curb and some of these other uh, like like uh, what's that the the Good Place and have them compete with sh- shit that's just like right there that you just got to click a ra- a radio button on. Yeah, no, that's a lot a barrier to entry for write in stuff. Right. Um, but yeah, no, thanks for, uh, for watching or listening to our, uh, 2017 Baldi's awards. It was a great year for television. Uh, I'm hoping that 2018 will continue the trend of being another great year for television. And we will be back next year for the fifth annual actual gala celebration. Yeah. All I promise is that there will be some gold bust that vaguely resembles Patrick Stewart that has the four previous winners for each category and and they'll be awesome and we'll show we'll show them off we'll show the the stewie this this the, the patrick we haven't decided like what's the official yeah i think it's the patrick i mean the baldy is a pretty pretty easy one but... yeah and he is a baldy yeah you bring home the gold baldy and that's what you get so maybe it should be platinum platinum mm-hmm. yeah really set ourselves out yeah from the crowd yeah oscar's gold yeah we're doing iridium <laughs> <laughs> we're, 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 we can launch these things into space, baby. Uh, all right. Thanks uh, for joining us for the award show. Uh, we'll be back next year. Thanks for uh, making 2017 another great year for us. And uh, we'll see what happens in 2018. See everybody. Good night. Tip your waiters. Bye. Prime ribs. Usually good.